Good day, everyone. Um, my name is Rashid Adeleke. I would like to welcome everyone into this special event that has been designed to celebrate the World um, Antibiotic Awareness Week. I hope every one of us is doing well. I would like to start by welcoming um, all the guests that we have. I acknowledge the presence of our Deputy Dean, um, Professor Rodney Medupe. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of some of our directors. Thank you for attending the program. Um, the colleagues, all the school, <clears throat> all the school um, subject, um, the subject group leaders, and as well as um, the students that are attending the event. My task today is, is so easy. It's just to call on people to come and speak. So I'm happy about that. Um, so um, just some few information about how the program is, how we are going to go about the program. So um, please take note that um, just some housekeeping rules. You will not be able to use your microphone Please, if there is any question that you want to ask during the presentations, please use your um, use the Q and A feature that is on your screen there. If you look at your screen, is um, is is at the center of um, the bottom center of your screen. So um, just type your questions there, and I would be able to read the questions out after the presentations. Um, then please make sure that you concentrate we concentrate very well when the speakers are speaking try as much as possible not to get distracted these days what we what we the challenge we have with um, virtual meetings is you don't know what people are doing so um we don't really want to know what you are doing but please try as much as possible to concentrate so that we can all benefit from this, um, this program. Um, before I officially start the program, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, speakers, the two of them. I will introduce them later in the program. So um, let's, first listen, let's first listen to our Deputy Dean, who will um, open this event. Professor Rodney Medupe, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rashida. Distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I wish to welcome you all on behalf of the Executive Dean, Professor Mudise, who could not be here with us this evening but sends his regards to all of you and, uh, and, and, and send his welcomes as well uh, to this evening's uh, webinar that is organized by the Unit for Environmental Science and Management in the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. Furthermore, I wish to recognize the presence of the director of UES, UESM, Professor Carlos bezaidin Ho, and also Dr. Mulale Tom, Dr. Rashida, and other organizers of this event and colleagues. Thank you for the efforts, for your efforts to educate us on important, important topics of health and environment. And of course, warm welcome to the two main speakers tonight, uh, Dr. Kim McAllister and Mr. Heriko Heistek, who I believe will wow us and educate, educate us uh, with their expert knowledge. Now I would like to give some background to the world Antibiotics Awareness Week and the related activities that are being organized by UESM. In May 2015, the World Health Assembly endorsed a global action plan to tackle antimicrobial resistance. The most urgent trend to address was antibiotic resistance and thus World Antibiotics Awareness Week, WOW, was born. This year in May, the World Health Organization, WHO, and its stakeholders expanded the scope of WOW, changing the focus from antibiotics to the more encompassing and inclusive term 
antimicrobials. Following the lead of WHO, the Northwest University has for the past two years hosted very successful public and academic lectures, as well as local community engagements on antibiotics. This year, we also broaden it to cover antimicrobial microbial awareness. Antimicrobial resistance is occurring everywhere in the world, comp compromising our ability to treat infectious diseases, as well as undermining many other advances in health and medicine. The goal of the draft global action plan and the activities we are participating in this week is to ensure for as long as possible continuity of successful treatment and prevention of infectious diseases with effective and safe medicines that are quality assured, used in a responsible way and are accessible to all who need them. Expanding the scope of the campaign to all micro, micro, uh, microbials with will facilitate a more inclusive global response to my antimicrobial resistance and support a multi-sectoral One Health approach with increased stakeholder engagement. The slogan, for, the slogan for 2020 is antimicrobials handle with care. It's applicable to all sectors. In the environmental sector in which UESM conduct research, the focus is on dissemination of antimicrobial, antimicrobial organisms such as bacteria or fungi, as well as spread of antimicrobial resistance genes that ultimately contribute to the increased burden of antimicrobial resistance. The sources that are under investigation include water bodies, i.e. wastewater treatment plants and drinking water facilities, surface and groundwater, as well as marine sewage outfalls, soil, animals, and crop yields. World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, WOW, aims to increase awareness of global antimicrobial resistance, AMR, and to encourage best practices among general public, health workers, and policymakers to avoid further emergence and spread of drug-resistant infections. The key components of this is addressing, number one, misuse and overuse of antimicrobial in humans, animals, and plants. Number two, lack of access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene for both humans and animals. I want to thank you for taking time to join this public lecture that will contribute to one of the key objectives of WOW strategic plan in improving awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance by means of effective communication, education, and training. Thank you all and enjoy the public lecture this evening. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much, Professor Meduke. We appreciate that. Um, I'm not sure if my video is appearing, but it doesn't matter, at least everyone can hear me. So um, now we move to the next item on the agenda. We, I will now introduce our next speaker. So just some information about our next speaker. He was born in Innisfil, Alberta. He obtained his MSc at the University of Alberta and his PhD from the University of Guelph in 1991. Um, he, he has expertise in many aspects, I mean, in many areas of science. He can be referred to as a technologist, biologist, or a scientist. But he has this special interest in antimicrobial resistance in beef cattle production systems. I think I should mention that um, when I saw his CV that he has published over 850 articles, I, I couldn't really believe that. So I had to do my own Google search. What? And guess what? <laughs> it is actually true. This year alone, he has about 49 publications. Hmm. He has been cited more than 41,000 times and his age index on Google is 97. Tim is a recipient of many awards from different globally recognized companies such as Pfizer, the Canadian Animal Industries, Elanco, 
the American Feed Industry Research, as well as um, Queen's um, Diamond Jubilee Medal and the Governor General's Award for Excellence in Public Service. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we cannot, uh, I'm aware that we cannot see you, or they cannot even confirm if you are going to clap or smile or be excited. But please, ladies and gentlemen, join me <laughs> to welcome our guest who has in the past contributed ideas to the intergovernmental panel on Nobel winning climate change concepts, coordinated by former Vice President Al Gore. Please, Dr. Tim McAllister, the floor is yours. Well, thank, thanks very much, Dr. Pilia. It's uh, a great honor to give the presentation here to your folks this, uh, this evening, which is early morning in, in, in Canada here. Uh, and we're, we're also in the middle of winter, so it's snowing outside as well. So um, I'm just going to share my screen. Ho hopefully you can see that okay. This is fine. Please go on. Great, great. Okay, okay. So uh, this morning, what I thought I, I did, that to, that I do, or this after or to this evening, uh, would be to just give you an example of an approach to looking at antimicrobial resistance from a One Health perspective uh, in cattle production system. So this is a study that we did in Canada uh, that's been published in, in scientific reports. And I think from uh, when we talk about antimicrobial resistance, it's very important to take a One Health uh, perspective because antimicrobial use has impacts on human health, on animal health, and on environmental health. And so that's the approach we tried to take in, in the study that I'll present to you today. So antimicrobial use in livestock production uh, occurs in three principal um, manners. Uh, antimicrobials may be used therapeutically, uh, where basically they're used to treat diseased animals that are showing clinical symptoms of disease. They can also be used uh, metaphylactically, and where a group of animals are treated to combat disease in the proportion of them uh, and to prevent disease from occurring in the rest. So disease is uh, present in part of the population, but rather than just treating, and then prophylaxis or pro prophylactic treatment involves the treatment or use of antimicrobials during periods of high risk uh, when there's a great uh, risk of susceptibility to, to infections. So in the case of uh, beef cattle production, that would occur from the time that we move them from the more extensive ranching operations where they're out on grasslands to the more intensive confined feedlot uh, production systems that we use in, in, in Canada to finish the cattle. So our, our production system in cattle is very much like uh, the, the same as what it is in the United States. So the production system itself, as I mentioned, involves uh, the cow-calf sector, which is, is really out on extensive rangeland. So about 80% of the diet of uh, the cow-calf sector represents forage. So most of the time, uh, those animals are out on pasture-based systems, uh, consuming forage often in native grassland systems here in, in, in Alberta, where I'm from. Um, and those, those animals uh, graze over the, the spring, summer, and, and early fall seasons before they're then uh, fed conserved forages over the winter period, uh, which is where we are now in, in our production cycle. So once... Uh, Late fall, those calves are weaned from the cows and are shipped into what we call backgrounding lots. And that's the first time that they would get a fairly high level of antimicrobial use. Then they're shipped from a backgrounding lot or changed to a finishing diet. There may be antimicrobial use then as well uh, when they're in these confined pens where you're looking at about between 100 and 300 animals per, per pen. Uh, and so you've got a situation where the animals are under stress because of weaning. Uh, transport to the feedlot itself, and introduction to an entirely new diet that they hadn't previously encountered while they were out in the extensive rangeland systems. And as a result, then the, the incidence of disease increases, and one way to combat that disease is to administer uh, antimicrobials metaphylactic upon arrival at the feedlot. 
Of course, we then uh, want to minimize the occurrence of antimicrobial resistance bacteria then moving into the retail sector. And we have a number of processes in place within slaughter plants, uh, such as thermal treatments, uh, lactic acid washes, et cetera, all that are designed to reduce the overall risk of bacteria ending up on the retail product that's presented to the consumer. And those uh, mitigation strategies are equally effective at removing either antimicrobial resistant bacteria or susceptible bacteria from the final food product. It's important to keep in mind that antimicrobial resistance in itself does not cause infection or disease uh, once it's uh, consumed by humans. Uh, so a bacteria does not need to to be antimicrobial resistant in order to cause disease. So this is just an illustration of one of those intensive feedlot uh, uh, operations, a scenario photo that we took. Uh, and this just shows the layout of the feedlot pens. So in each of these pens, there'd be between 100 and 300 animals. Uh, this lot in itself houses around 25,000 head of cattle. Uh, you can see that they are in open outdoor pens. Uh, they're fed along Feed bunks here are right into individual pen as well. But we also have to think about the surrounding environment. So rainfall or, or snow melt, which would take place from the feedlot, and that water that runs off is caught in these catch basins that we see here. And then we can see in the broader environment, then they usually irrigate out onto the croplands, the surrounding croplands that you see here and here. Uh, and there's also creek, epimeral creeks or creeks that run as well. So in this study, we see from the catch basin as well, and then also from the surrounding creek and the soils uh, in the agricultural lands that are surrounding the feedlots. We sampled from a total of four different feedlots located at uh, different locations within the province of Alberta. So here's Alberta here, this is the country of Canada. Most of the cattle, about 60% of the cattle in Canada are located in Alberta. And the area that I'm in here in Lethbridge uh, represents what we call Canada's major feedlot uh, production area within the country. Uh, uh, so, and then we also sampled from the human health perspective, uh, where we took samples from sewage treatment plants in Calgary, which is upstream uh, from the feedlot production area, and Medicine Hat, which is downstream from the feedlot cattle production area. And, and that's what represents why it's a, a One Health production because we're sampling from livestock, from the environment and from human health related in the terms of urban wastewater. And we also collected clinical samples out of the Calgary hospital here as well uh, as part of this overall study. Now this just represents then those samples that were collected. Um, so the samples were collected from each of those environments. In some cases, then we, we use selective media to isolate specifically ESBLs or extended spectrum beta lactamase resistant E. coli, as well as enterococci. We isolated gram positive enterococci on macrolid selective plates because there's a lot of macrolids that are used in beef cattle production. And enterococci are a good indicator organism of macrolid resistance. We then speciated those or genotyped them in case of E. coli, speciated in, in the case of enterococci, and then sequenced those to determine also the AMR phenotype uh, through antimicrobial NCLSI testing, as well as the AMR genotype. Also collected just DNA out of it directly to use shotgun metagenomic sequencing to characterize the nature of the uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria, both phylogenetically, their distribution, as well as the type of uh, carried uh, throughout that continuum. So here's what we found when we look at that, at that study. So these are all the species of enterococci here. So you can see that enterococci is a, is a is a genus, genera is quite a diverse group with several different species. And we isolated numerous species from these various environments. But if you look at where we found, if we start out in the cattle side of things with the bovine feces, 
we found an overall dominance of Enterococcus hirae. So that's the predominant species that exists within the intestinal tract of cattle. Now, occasionally we're getting other species as well, but you can see that they account for a very small portion of that total 4,500 isolates that we obtain. Then when we move to the feedlot catch basin, so that's the region or uh, body water, of water that collects the material that runs off the feedlot, you can still we see still see a lot of Enterococcus hirae, but we start to see other species emerge, and uh, as well as Ficalis amphisium. So the species distribution starts to change. When we go to that creek, the natural water sources in the vicinity, you can see a further increase in the uh, presence of of the uh, of the environmental species or environmentally associated species of enterococci, a further reduction in the presence of hirae, and an increase in the amount of Ficalis amphisium. And then when we move to the urban wastewater plant system, you can see we see a dramatic change where now Enterococcus specium and Enterococcus faecalis predominate, and the other species constitute a relatively small portion of the total uh, isolates that we obtain. And then when you finally, when you move to the clinical cases, so isolates that we're collecting out of people suffering from various infections in the hospital, you can see that the Ephesium and Fecalis, particularly Fecalis, dominates now the endercoci that are associated with causing infections in people. And when we move to the bovine pro the beef processing plant, you can see we still see a high level of Fecalis and we, see, we still see Hirae present associated with the beef processing plant. And interestingly enough, when we look at along the slaughtering uh, continuum, the Enterococcus here are associated or isolated from the front end of the plant where the kill floor and initial slaughtering takes place. And the Enterococcus faecalis is being isolated from the trim or from the final product that's being produced coming out of the plant itself. So it suggests that in the front end of the plant, then we're seeing enterococci that's associated with cattle. But when we go to the back end where the final product, where we did get those isolates, we're finding that they're more associated with, with uh, the isolates that we were finding in people. So it suggests that there could be some room for some hygienic improvements in the plant. Now, the overall number of isolates that we're getting uh, per sample is, is much smaller in the beef processing because of all of those steps to remove bacteria. We have to take many more samples to get 774 isolates relative to the 4,500 that we could get out of, out of uh, bovine feces. So you can see that there's a distinct difference in the species that exist depending upon where you're sampling from within that one health continuum. Now, when we sequence those isolates, then when we look at the genotypes, uh, in this case, in Enterococcus faecalis, we sequenced 366. So we only focused on those uh, faecalis and faecium, those isolates that are most important to human health. So even though we got very few isolates out of cattle of that species, when we look at those isolates that we did get and we sequence them, we can see that they, they tend to cluster separately between those that we're getting from human sources uh, relative to those that we're getting from uh, beef cattle sources or out of the other broader environmental sources. So if you look at this, you can see that all of these isolates here in this ring represent urban wastewaters or clinical isolates. Uh, when we look at the cattle isolates, they be processing and bovine feces, they tend to cluster together. Now, occasionally there are other isolates that are intermixed amongst those. Um, which are coming from bovine feces and, and, and from, from the beef processing plants and the catch basin. Uh, and in those cases, those may represent actually isolates that have been acquired from humans to cattle rather than, than from uh, cattle to humans, uh, where they've acquired the human-based isolate rather than uh, the cattle isolates. So even when you look at the, within a species, we find genomic differences between those uh, isolates that are associated with the human uh, one health uh, continuum relative to the, what we see from the beef cattle uh, one health continuum. And when you look at the multi-drug resistance and the types of resistance that are present, we tend to find higher fluoroquinolone resistance in clinical and urban wastewater isolates than what we do in beef cattle isolates because there's few fluoroquinolones used in beef cattle, but there are fluoroquinolones used in humans. 
And when we looked at the multi-drug resistance, when we see the greatest multi-drug resistance, which you'll see a few cases here, here and here, those are associated with isolates that are coming from clinical settings, not from beef cattle production. And basically we see the same pattern with Enterococcus fecium. These are the clinical uh, VRE or clinical isolates. You can see they cluster together here in one clade and here in another clade. And we see the beef cattle isolates tend to cluster separately. So we're finding the same sort of pattern with two different species. And when we look at the same with the resistance, I think you can see the level of fluoroquinolone resistance here, the yellow line that's associated with the Enterococcus specium, and the same up here with this clade, you see the high levels of fluoroquinolone resistance relative to the isolates that are coming from human sources. And likewise, when we look at multi-drug resistance so up to seven different antimicrobials, we see that those are also associated with the isolates that are coming from humans, not the isolates that were acquired from beef cattle. So even though we seldom saw our isolated Enterococcus fecium or Enterococcus vicalis from cattle, when we did isolate uh, those species, they were shown to be different from those that are associated with humans. So it suggests that the cattle are not responsible in terms of the contamination or acquisition of, of endococci in humans and uh, linked to human infections, infections in, in people. Now this, this just illustrates that in, in uh, looking at the resistance genes. And you can see in some cases, uh, intercost, both fecalis and fecium rep, or exhibit intrinsic resistance. So all of them are resistant to these particular uh, antimicrobials uh, associated with uh, uh, streptogranulin resistance, as well as some of the aminoglycosides that they're, they're uh, intrinsically resistant to. So all of the uh, intercosti, regardless of source, are resistant to those isolates, uh, to those antimicrobials. Where we do see uh, differences is, is related to the sources is when you're looking at urban wastewaters. Again, we, we find the resistances that are associated with uh, uh, fluoroquinolone resistance. And when we did find vancomycin resistance, which was very seldom even in, in clinical isolates, uh, that vancomycin resistance was also related to that from urban wastewater, not those associated with cattle production systems. So in some cases, there is a high level of, of uh, commonality in the resistance though between those isolates. If you look here between macrolid resistance, so resistance to uh, carrying the gene ERM-B, which uh, encodes resistance to uh, macrolids, including erythromycin. You can see there's a high level of that macrolid, macrolid resistance across all of the isolates. And the same with tetracycline resistance. We find a lot of the, uh, resistance determinant TET-M across the enterococci, regardless of uh, uh, their source or where they originated from. So macrolin and tetracycline resistance was quite high in fecalis and fecine, regardless of, of the source that they were, uh, originated. In some cases, though, the types of genes did differ uh, between the source from, from where they came from. So just to look at that a, a bit closer then, this represents all the different antimicrobial resistance genes, including uh, resistance to the bile side, quaternary ammonia. And when we look at the impact of, of that related to the source, okay, in terms of the beef processing plant, interestingly, you can see that we found genes in those enterococci, in, in this case, fecalis, uh, that were coding for resistance to quaternary ammonia, suggesting that some of the disinfectants that they're using uh, within the beef processing facility are selecting for resistance to these biocides that contain quaternary ammonia compounds. When we looked at the beef feces, we find the high level of resistance to tetracycline and the same with the catch basin. So we find a lot of those tetracycline resistance genes present. But when we look at the wastewater treatment plant, you can see those isolates, how much diversity they exhibit in terms of their antimicrobial resistance. So they were resistant to aminoglycosides that contain genes coding for resistance to aminoglycosides, to macrolids, 
uh, to streptothrycin as well, and to leucosamides, and to spectinomycin. So a much greater diversity of resistance uh, genes were present in the wastewater treatment isolates relative to isolates that were obtained from other environments. And this, again, just likely reflects the variety of antimicrobials that are used in human medicine and the selective pressure that's exerted as a result of that. Some of that may also to disposal of insert selective pressure for uh, carriage of these genes within E. faecalis. So that represents basically using indicator organisms. I, I, I'm not gonna present the data uh, that we uh, derived with regard to extended spectrum beta-lactamase resistant bacteria, but basically the same sort of pattern was found with E. coli in that uh, we had to use extremely high selective pressures enrichment procedures in order to get ESBLs out of the cattle production system. But within the sewage treatment plant, we could isolate ESBLs directly from the sewage with no enrichment from, from human sewage. And likewise, when we did the sequencing on those isolates, we found that those ESBL related E. coli that we found from cattle production systems systems genetically differed or clustered separately from those associated with human systems. So we demonstrated that concept with two different uh, genera of bacteria as well. Now that all represents a huge amount of work to do the isolations, collect those samples, uh, et cetera, from all, all of those different locations. And it took a huge team of people to pull that research off. Another approach is, is the metagenomic shotgun sequencing that I described. So in this case, what we do is all we need to do is collect the biological samples from across that continuum again, which is what we did. Uh, but in this case, we don't have to go through the process of either selective uh, isolation of, of, of bacteria onto selective plates and all of the uh, purification, et cetera, identification and that that has to go through the steps that are needed to do that when you're using indicator organisms. So in this case, what we did is we collected uh, just biological samples from these various environments, and then we extract the DNA, and then we shotgun sequence that DNA, and then using 16S uh, RNA, uh, we develop a phylogenetic description of that uh, bacteria that are associated with that sample. And by running it through a AMR database for over 3000 antimicrobial resistance genes, we can also then determine the nature of the antimicrobial resistance genes that are present within that DNA. So that, that being process, then uh, running it through the AMR++ database, which is the database that contains the over 3000 antimicrobial resistance genes that I mentioned uh, to do, define which antimicrobial resistance determinants are present. And then doing a taxonomical analysis using Kraken uh, to get a phylogenetic distribution of the bacterial species or genera that are present within those samples. And then finally the output data, which is what I'm going to show you next. So when you look at those information that's generated, you can see that regardless of whether you're looking at, in this case, the microbial genera, so the microbial genera between the fecal samples, the catch basin, the soil samples and the sewage effluent all clustered separately, showing that the nature of the bacteria that reside, uh, bacterial genera that reside within these various environments differ substantially from one another, such that they cluster separately. And when you look at the antimicrobial resistance genes they contain, they also cluster separately. Quite often uh, different, uh, biological uh, components of the bacterial community will harbor different antimicrobial resistance genes as well. So as a result, if you change the species distribution uh, within an env environment as a result of some sort of environmental influence, a good example would be like the application of manure to, to cropland, to soil land, to soil as a fertilizer source, you'll change the distribution of the microbial species within that soil sample. And as a result, you'll also change the nature of the antimicrobial resistance genes that are there because they tend to be linked to the species that they're associated with. So when we do that comparative sequencing then based on the microbiota that are present, you can see that when we look at the fecal samples, 
uh, there's a high level of firmicutes present uh, in the fecal samples from the cattle. When you move to the catch basin, then you see a dramatic increase in the amount of proteobacteria and a reduction in the presence of firmicutes. When you move to the soil uh, bacteria, you still have a high level of proteobacteria, but a dramatic increase in actinobacteria as well, and an absence of firmicutes. So this is uh, land that was uh, fertilized using manure. So that That suggests that the firm competitive ones are exposed to the broader environment, soil environment, uh, where they may be subject to, to UV light and other uh, nutrient deficiencies, et cetera, that prevent their uh, competition or predominance within that soil environment relative to the intestinal environment within the cattle themselves. And then when you look at the sewage effluent, you see firmicutes are present again, coming from the human sources, but a high level of proteobacteria bacteria as well, and, and a high level, quite a high level of bacteriodes, which we also saw as well. So bacteriodes and firmicutes tend to favor or be associated with the intestinal environment. And when we look at the antimicrobial resistance genes, then we find the distribution being production system. So if you look at the fecal samples from the cattle, uh, we find a, a, high, a high level of resistance to macrolids and a high level of resistance to tetracyclines and very low levels of resistance to other antimicrobials. So macrolids and tetracyclines represent the predominant antimicrobials that are used in beef cattle production. When we move to the catch basin, we start to see other resistances emerge, such as resistance to the sulfonamides uh, and, and to some extent uh, to other antimicrobial resistance genes as well that are associated with efflux pumps. And we still see quite a predominance of, of macrolid and, and tetracycline resistance. But then when you move to the soil environments, you see an entire change in the profile where macrolid resistance becomes very small and we have a, a predominance of resistance to glycopeptides and, and uh, multi-drug resistance components as well. So that again reflects the changes in the microbial species that are present within these environments and the associated differences in, in the resistance determinants. A lot of the antimicrobials that we use today originated from soil, originally from soil uh, bacteria. And then finally in the human sewage, uh, you can see a much greater diversity of antimicrobial resistance genes, including resistance to fluoroquinolones, as, as we talked about earlier, but sulfinamides as well. And the other interesting is a, a high level of resistance to mercury as well, which uh, suggests contamination of the sewage treatment plant with ke other chemicals, uh, some of which may be heavy metal containing or, or mercury containing that select for those resistance determinants and those isolates uh, within, within that environment as well. And when we look at the specific genes that are present, so this represents all the antimicrobial resistance genes that uh, predominant ones that we screen for. Uh, what you'll see from the heat map is that uh, tetracycline resistance is abundant uh, across the livestock samples. So the genes determinants associated with tetracycline resistance are quite predominant. They're also quite predominant within the wastewater treatment uh, system as well, but they're virtually absent from the soil uh, system. Likewise, macrolid resistance, uh, which is shown here, is predominant within those genes that are coding for macrolid resistance are predominant within the fecal samples and within the catch basin and within the human samples as well. But when we go to genes associated with fluoroquinolone resistance, you can see that they're almost exclusively related to the samples that are coming from the human wastewater and absence from those present in, in, in cattle production systems. So what makes sense, it all kind of lines up in, in terms of uh, the types of resistances determinants you see. We see a, a greater dominance of those that are uh, related back to the uh, resistance that we saw. And in order to test one of the disadvantages of metagenomic sequences is obviously uh, at this point, we can't determine whether phenotypic resistance is being uh, expressed or not. Uh, but if you think about linking the metagenomic sequencing back up to the bacterial isolation data, 
that I showed you, it all lines up in that those indicator organisms also tended to show the same antimicrobial resistance patterns as what we're showing here with the metagenomic sequencing. So in summary, the, the Andrococcus species profiles of bovine isolates differ from human-associated isolates, suggesting that endercoci from beef cattle may not play a significant role in the occurrence of colonization or clinical infections in humans. And so that's within a species that we're seeing that difference, let alone the huge difference that we saw across species in that Andrococcus herae predominated in cattle and fecalis and feceum predominated in human sources. The ARG profile of Endococcus fecalis and feceum are originating from cabin on human sources reflect that the respective antimicrobial use in those two sectors. However, several antimicrobial genes did overlap across that continuum. Uh, so it is possible that those G ARGs will confer resistance in both uh, uh, fecal material from cattle and from humans. Andrococcus species profiles identified in beef processing fluent may reflect the intersection of livestock and humans, uh, possibly suggesting that there could be use for some uh, improved hygienic practices uh, within the processing plant. Distinct microbiota and resistant compositions existed in antimicrobial profiles seem to be a reflection of antimicrobial use in those environments. Tetracycline and macrolide resistance were predominant in the beef production system, whereas in the sewage influent uh, samples, we saw macrolide and tetracyclines, but also beta lactams, aminoglycosides, and fluoroquinolones, so a much more diverse uh, resistance profile. And then the high abundance of, of mercury resistance in, in the sewage effluent may be an ex, uh, uh, a reflection of the contamination of municipal water with household and, and industrial products as well. So that's kind of what I had today. I, I think that this model is, you know, applicable across many agricultural systems. So not just beef cattle production. You could use the same approach uh, in in the case for swine or poultry production systems. Um, the the one component that we, you know, we couldn't cover in in this study. I showed you the complexity of the beef cattle production system, and in our case, we just focused on the intensive component. We didn't look at the more extensive component, where you're looking at the cow calf system, where they're out on uh, extensive grasslands. But because the antimicrobial use within those production systems is much lower than what it is in intensive systems, we would. Uh, speculate that you would see residual levels of antimicrobial resistance genes within those animals, but the density of those genes would be far lower and the diversity would be much lower than what we see in intensive uh, feedlot production systems. So I just want to thank the team, the research team that we have uh, working on, uh, worked on the project and on all the numerous collaborators we had within Alberta in order to carry this uh, work out. It takes quite a bit of effort to get collaboration among individuals, spittles, and sewage treatment uh, facilities, within beef processing facilities, to get all those people on board simultaneously in order to allow a study like this to occur is, is quite a challenging uh, thing to achieve. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I, again, I appreciate the opportunity to give the presentation today. Thank you very much, um, Dr. McAllister. And um, that is a lot of work that has been comprised into a 30 minute presentation. Um, we would wait till the end of the session, I mean, till, till the end of the program before we entertain questions. Um, but if you want to read your question under the Q&A section, please feel free to do so, but we would engage you more after the second presentation. Thank you very much. So um, our next presenter is um, Mr. Enrico Estek. Um, Mr. Enrico Estek is um, a practicing pharmacist with a special interest in antibiotics over the cancer solutions and medicinal interactions. He likes working with students. He likes that a lot. Um, he completed his BSc degree in zoology and biochemistry in 2008. Thereafter, he continued with um, a diploma, a teaching diploma degree. 
He then completed another degree in B Pharm, um, Bachelor of Pharmacy, and obtained his MSc in Pharmaceuticals. Um, he has been a speaker of the World Antibiotic Awareness Week at the Northwest University since 2018, since the year 2018, and is involved in various other awareness programs focusing on the onset of strokes from viral infections. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to welcome um, Mr. Istik to give the next presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be, be presenting today. So let me just quickly share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. OK, Go perfect. On. So antimicrobials, it's a last line of defense against microbes. And to put that into context, all living things are in a battle of survival. Us as human beings, luckily, has been blessed by an amazing immune system capable of defeating most microbial attacks on our body. Unfortunately, some are capable of making us really ill. And it's then that we need to call in our last line of defense, the antimicrobials. But the other side, the bacteria and viruses and fungi are also fighting back. And um, they're developing a resistance against our best weapons. And that resistance isn't futile, it's downright dangerous. So antibiotics turned out to be a bit of a a fragile weapon. But in order to, to see where the whole resistance thing has started, we need to start at the beginning. Prior to 1928, we had only the arsenicals as a weapon against microbes. And in my honest opinion, these drugs were about as dangerous as the illnesses they tried to cure. But in 1928, Alexander Fleming accidentally discovered penicillin. And um, by 1944, the mass production of basal penicillin was perfected. And in the following years, the widespread use of antibiotics followed. And this led to some diseases that were, weren't curable beforehand that was now curable. In the words of Alexander Fleming, one sometimes find what one's not looking for. When I woke up just after dawn, September 28, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic or bacteria killer. But I suppose that was exactly what I did. In the following years, there was a boom in the discovery of antimicrobials stretching between 1950 to 1960. And there was a rapid discovery of new antimicrobial compounds in this 10 years. And the scary thing is a third of all antimicrobial agents that we use today were discovered in that 10 years. So if we take a look visually at it, we can see that there's a peak around about 1960 and then a rapid reduction in the amount of new compounds that was discovered. In that golden age of antibiotics, they were prescribed to basically everyone. If you stab your toe, you got an antibiotic because it works and it's safe. Um, it was used indiscriminately and is, as, as Dr. McAllister said, still being used as an animal growth promoter by today. And due to the fact that it was widely and this, um, available and easily obtainable, it was used to treat illnesses that might have been prevented through lifestyle changes. And we'll take a closer look at this, at this by looking at a few old school adverts. Here we can see there's not one, but three different antimicrobial agents being used as a growth promoter in, in olden days poultry farming. Penicillin was widely advertised in, in pharmacies or drugstores as they were known. And this led to a, a demand for prescription for this, um, these antimicrobial agents. And some pharmacists even handed them out to people without a prescription. Lifestyle, need I say more? So, as the book stated in, in Star Trek, 
resistance is futile. But the series has proven us time and time again that resistance is not futile. Because once an antimicrobial agent is introduced to an environment, susceptible cells are affected. And usually this susceptible cells are good at competing in an environment where the antimicrobial agent is not available. So they outcompete cells that might have a little bit of intrinsic um, resistance to these, these antimicrobial agents. But once an antimicrobial agent is introduced into a population, the septal cells die off. And after some time, it leads to a, a proliferation of uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. When there's only bacteria and no antimicrobial agents in an environment, your evolutionary rate is low. And as the concentration of antimicrobial agents increases, you get, you, you get to a point where there's a very high evolutionary rate because these organisms are fighting to adapt to a changing environment that's trying to kill them. And we can see that they're, they're finding ways to survive by developing genes or evolving genes that render them immune to some antimicrobial agents. Usually this takes place in, through gene transfer by mediated by plasmids. So as I stated, antibiotics are a bit of a, a glass cannon. They hit hard, but they're not infallible. They can be broken. To illustrate, um, from in the 1980s, there was this notion that some antibiotics are not as effective as they were any, anymore at the start for the treatment of some illnesses. And by today, we're looking at an almost 60% um, caseload of methicillin resistance of Lucoccus aureus in, in hospital cases with uh, vancomycin resistant enterococci and fluoroquinolone resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa not far behind. This creates a bit of a problem because we are running out of antibiotics that we can use to treat these illnesses. So how did we get to this point where we need to fight to keep our glass cannon intact? Well, there's, there's bad prescribing practices. Um, some treatment guidelines specify the use of antibiotics for certain symptoms, and no tests were done to determine if it's a bacterial or non-bacterial infection. And some viral and bacterial diseases can give you the same symptomatic um, or list of symptoms. Broad spectrum antibiotics are most probably used or are mostly used for a shotgun approach. We don't really know what's wrong with you. There's not time to test. So we will kill everything that might cause this illness if it's a bacteria. And then what we need to keep in mind is doctors' practices are businesses. And if patients demand a prescription for antibiotics, you're going to get an unnecessary prescription for it. And this links directly to our next, our next ammo. Just to recap, antibiotics do not work for viruses. You get antiviral agents for that. They most also don't, do not work for fungi. You get antifungals for them. So why, how do, do doctors justify and other healthcare workers justify giving out antibiotics freely? Well, they're, they're quite safe as a medicine. And if we can, if somebody believes that an antibiotic will cure an illness, even that, that that illness isn't caused by a bacteria, you believe that you'll get better and placebo works. There might be a secondary bacterial infection following a primary uh, viral infection. So let's give an antibiotic and it's going to stop infection later down the line. And then uh, I'll only hand it out this one time and that one time usually do not stay one time. Then we've got public expectations. Doctors that prescribe antibiotics are seen as good doctors. Doctors that are hesitant to, to prescribe antimicrobials are usually seen as, you don't want to cure me, you just want to make money and I will not come back. People falsely believe that antibiotics will cure 
any disease. And as stated on the previous slide, it drives prescription numbers. And doctors will give out antibiotics to keep feet coming to their practice. A, a vicious circle forms, driving unnecessary antibiotic prescriptions. Now, just to clarify this, do, I'm, I'm not saying that doctors are bad, but they, they also need money to, to feed their families. So we, we've seen this with COVID and, and um, chloroquine, or the shortage of chloroquine in South Africa, believe that non-recommended drugs will work, antibiotics for a viral illness. And then people also ask for antibiotics in a prophylactic way to stop becoming ill if they go overseas or on a holiday. In a study done in the UK, almost a thousand people over a course of six months presented with uh, flu-like symptoms. 200 of these uh, contacted or visited their local doctor. Uh, from that 200, 100 people were expected to, to receive a prescription for antibiotics. 70 of those did, but only 53 finished the antibiotic course. What happened to the other 20%? So if symptoms go, um, lessen and you stop using the antibiotic, you, might, you might, have, might still have some bacteria left in your system that is at such a low stage that no symptoms are there, but you still yeah, you, you create uh, resistance by keeping bacteria in your body that's causing an illness and not killing them all off. And we as patients and as the public are placing doctors under pressure to prescribe antibiotics. And I think if, if we educate ourselves and we as pharmacists educate our patients, we'll get to a point where this pressure for antibiotic prescriptions will lessen. I've shown this slide previously, but there's one important extra line here, and that's the blue line. The blue line represents the number of companies doing antimicrobial research. In 1990, there was 18 companies. In 2012, there's four. And um, this le leaves us with a bit of a problem. So let's take a look at the major causes of death in 2014. So, Antimicrobial resistance in 2014 resulted in 700,000 deaths. And it's not really a drop in the, the bucket compared to cancer or diabetes. But if you fast forward 20 years and you get to 2050, then 10 million people will die yearly of antimicrobial resistance if we continue as we're continuing. Just to put things into perspective, our current pandemic, the death rate falls nicely between road traffic accidents and diarrheal disease, about 1.32 million people um, up to this stage has died from COVID-19. And then the bad news, Africa will be hardest hit. Why? Mostly because we're a poor, we're a poor continent. And people do not have real access to really available sanitation, such as running water or quality um, health care. So, We've been talking about antibiotics and bacteria up to this point, um, but there's other fronts that we, we are fighting on regarding resistance, and that's resistance against antifungals and, um, anti, and, and antivirals as well. So in a sense, the antifungals are in a, in a worse spot than the antibiotics because there's only four chemical classes of antifungals currently available. And an organism, one organism, Candida auris, is already resistant to against all clinical antifungals. So, if that that organism starts to spread, and then we've got nothing to treat it. Luckily, um, the symptoms are quite benign. There's also rising resistance noted in the pathogenic species of Aspergillus, Scylosporium, and Fusarium, and most probably we'll get to the point where these organisms are resistant to all available antifungals, and then we're going to have a bit of a problem. Viruses, viruses are in some cases worse, in some cases better, because they're very fast mutators. If there's anti antiviral agent available, 
resistance will increase. If prescription rates drop, so do resistance against that specific um, organism. So let's just take a look at what drives resistance in itself. So you get our, our species or our human species are reproductive output we need to eat. So we practice um, a few things that's not uh, really good for, for our, <laughs> our use of medicine. So, but what way we, way we can make a change is in the, the differential survival rates. We can do a bit better, more research, develop more chemical um, diversity in our anti, antimicrobial um, list of antimicrobials we can use. We can stop giving long courses of prophylaxis um, or treatment with the same drug and stop using repeat treatments with the same fungicides. Just to illustrate the point with viruses, um, if prescription rates are high, you get a, a following peak in, in, of high resistance and um, then as prescription rates drop, concurrently resistance do drop. Interesting enough, HIV is resistant to all forms of single drug use. That's why there's usually three drugs or three different um, HIV medic medication given at one stage, and that's how the virus is being controlled in, in a person. So what can we as a pharmacist do? We can educate. We can educate on the dangers of unnecessary antibiotic we use. We can promote good hygiene. And then we can promote a wait and see prescribing trend for doctors. What I usually recommend is doctors should give two prescriptions, one prescription to hand in immediately to treat the symptoms and another one with an antibiotic on it to, for the patient to hand in after five to seven days. If the symptoms aren't better, bring in an antibiotic script, we'll give it, um, but try and, and get better just using the symptomatic treatment. We should tell our patients to finish all, all the required um, antibiotics. Do not stop when feeling better. You should also vaccinate. Vaccinate stops, uh, vaccination stops viral infections. And if you can stop viral infections that gives, uh, gives you a similar um, symptom profile to some bacterial infections, uh, mostly upper respiratory tract infections, then we will we'll lower antibiotic prescriptions by being less ill. So antibiotics do not work for everything. They work for bacteria. Antivirals work for viruses and antifungals work for fungi. So if we continue as we are doing, we'll, we'll run out of time and these agents will stop work, stop their work when we really need them. So we need to, to stop crying wolf and save the antibiotic. As a member of the public, what can I do? I can educate myself on how illness is spread and um, how to combat combat that. We can try to avoid antibiotics and see if the illness resolves itself. If it doesn't, seek medical advice. We should, we should educate others on the danger of, dangers of antibiotic resistance. I, for one, will not want to live in a world where there's nothing to treat um, illnesses or bacterial illnesses. And then we're getting to the point of, of antimicrobial stewardship. If you do the above mentioned, you are part of an antimicrobial stewardship team. Just important here, this is a, a, a hospital leaflet on how to stop in, infection spread for a patient, the kitchen one, and they all start with hand washing. Luckily, the current pandemic has, has taken over a bit of this, uh, this education part from us and because everyone is aware that you need to wash your hands and and sanitized surfaces. So what is antimicrobial stewardship? Antimicrobial stewardship is a coordinated program that promotes the appropriate use of antimicrobials, including antibiotics, to improve patient outcomes, reduce antimicrobial resistance, and decrease the spread of infections that's caused by multi-drug resistant organisms. It's currently in use in hospitals in South Africa, and we can expand that to the community itself by promoting good hygiene and, and good antibiotic use. That definition might also expand to include infection control and microbial spread control. 
So keep calm and continue your antimicrobial stewardship. As Alexander Fleming did in 1928, we weren't looking to find resistance in, in microorganisms, but we did. And this has led to a point where multidisciplinary measures are necessary to curb the spread of microbial um, resistance. And there's exciting, exciting future research. Um, there's antibacterial viruses or phages that's being researched, metal containing nanoparticles um, used and uh, in antibacterial surfaces. There's some quick reads and then the questions we'll do a bit later. much for the presentation. Um, that's a very interesting presentation. So now, um, before I open the floor for questions, um, I would also like to ask some questions from the students. And if you get it right, there will be some prices. So it's just like reduce and jokes. So um, just type your answer using the chat option. That will be fine. I will see your answer. So what do you give to a man who has everything? That's a question. The second question is, um, why don't yogurt and medicine, why, do they, why don't they get along? The third one, um, one problem with um, antibiotics is that no matter how popular it gets, something never happens. So there are three questions there. So if you know the answer, just type the answer using the um, chat option. So um, now to the question and answer, I've not seen any question here per se, but there was a comment from, um, I think it's, it was from Dr. Lakota. Um, when I signed out, because there was a problem with my system, I signed out, so I lost that question. So I would ask someone who, one of the panelists to help me read out the question or the comments, or if um, Dr. McAllister can also see the question, you can answer, you can re respond to that comment. Yeah, the, the question is whether we can uh, share that Galaxy workflow for the AMR and metagenomics, and yeah, we can do that. So okay. I'll talk to my team, and we'll, I've got the email address, so we'll send you the information. Okay, okay, that's fine. Thank you so much. Um, questions, colleagues, questions from students, from all the other participants. Okay, while we are waiting for people to make up their mind on what to, which question to ask. Um, I have a question for you, Dr. Makulista. What, how, um, if we are talking about bowel fertilizer, I'm talking of microbial inoculant now, how dangerous do you think it is in terms of um, spreading antibiotic resistance in the environment? Um, with specific focus on um, agroecosystem. Well, I think if, if you're talking about like probiotics, use of probiotics as alternatives to antimicrobials, which is a big area of research right now. One of the requirements for registration of those products is that the whole genome sequencing be undertaken and that be demonstrated that they lack genes coding for antimicrobial resistance or they, they don't exhibit phenotypic resistance. But I think we have to keep in mind as well, like, you know, antimicrobial resistance is part of the natural microbial world. Antimicrobial resistance was not created by people. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, what people have done is we've dramatically increased the concentration of antimicrobials in environments, like when we administer them in the diet to livestock. We increase okay. the concentration of the antimicrobial in the digester, which would be much higher than what would normally occur out, for example, in a soil environment. So uh, we've done quite a bit of work, like I didn't show it, but we've got work from natural feedlots where they don't use any antimicrobials. 
And we still find antimicrobial resistance genes in those environments. The concentration of those genes is lower than what it is in a feedlot that uses antimicrobials, but they're still present. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I'm still waiting for questions from the audience. Questions? So if there are no other questions, then um, we'll have to round up then. I would call on um, Professor Carlos Zudelt, our Director of Research, to come and give vote of thanks. Um, there are many colleagues and um, other participants that um, will have to help us thank for attending this event. So Professor Carlos, um, over to you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, distinguished guests, staff, students, guest speakers specifically. Thank you very much um, for honoring this uh, event. Uh, the first event was held in 2018. Um, as uh, the program director has indicated, um, it started out with lectures, a symposium in the morning and then a public lecture in the afternoon. Uh, last year, we had a physical outreach um, accompanied with lectures. Um, unfortunately, this year, due to uh, the current scenario, um, that could not happen. But there were always stalwarts um, that were part of the planning and driving this annual event. So specifically, I want to thank uh, Dr. Lesejo Mulaletom, uh, Ms. Lee Shinaka, Mr. Abra Matlatsi, um, that were here since the beginning. And um, there were also some of our students that were part of this. And specifically, I want to highlight Ruan um, that has been involved with designing of material. This year, Liani was also involved with the outline uh, for today's event. Then organizers for 2020 included uh, Prof. Rashid and uh, Prof. Collins Ateba, as well as the rest of the staff in microbiology on both campuses and the students. Uh, I want to specifically thank Mr. Abram uh, Matlatsi for the San Oceans donation. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the deanery, particularly Prof. Uh, Madupe, for the support uh, in these events. Uh, last year he was in, in person, he was with us. Uh, this year he um, provided us with an overview, a history of antimicrobial resistance and he provided a very good overview. And I think perhaps um, he should consider microbiology as a career option. Um, uh, specifically within the field of antimicrobials. Then a special word of thanks to our guest speakers, uh, Dr. Tim McAllister. Thank you very much for providing us an excellent overview uh, with a specific case study um, in the One Health context where cattle and cattle production um, within this context our food and a major staple for many of us um, in this part of the world as well as, um, as elsewhere, and how the impact of the cattle on the environment as well as the clinical uh, environment, and the fact that you could clearly show that uh, there are distinct um, niches for specific species uh, of bacteria, and in this case, it was, uh, you call it enterococci, or you call it enterococci, but they were, comp they were a nice, uh, complete separation of, of this. Uh, so that opens up another set of questions. Um, and for specifically our graduate students <clears throat> that are always uh, going out there and want to uh, find, they go out to look for issues and they want to find it. And when they don't get the uh, 
result that they're looking for, that they come back and they say, my, my experiments are not working. And you have excellently demonstrated and your team has published in Nature your work um, that demonstrated um, the specific hypothesis that you've uh, started out with was not proven as uh, what was thought uh, it, it would be. Uh, once again, that work shows that it's, it's a lot of work um, in microbiology, particularly when you're doing classical microbiology, that is a lot of work that uh, and hours and, and frustration and, and everything that goes into it is blood, sweat and, te and tears. And uh, molecular biology provides an absolutely wonderful tool to support this. And all of this within the context of antimicrobial resistance. The overlay of the two, the classical microbiology and um, the uh, molecular biology provides an absolutely powerful um, answer to questions. Um, Mr. Enrico Heistek has been with us since 2018 uh, and has uh, constantly been there. Once again, thank you very much for um, a very basic um, history and um, development of AR, uh, AMR. Um, the public perceptions which you've highlighted once again with uh, some new examples, the specific message that you have for Africa. Thank you very much for that. I remember from your first talk, you said that stewardship starts at home and uh, COVID-19 has really come and demonstrated that uh, a number of these things uh, is what we can manage uh, if we practice basic uh, sanitation, uh, then we can prevent many of these infections that require these antimicrobial uh, resistance. You've also touched on um, antifungals as well as uh, antiviral agents. And I think that is a a specific topic or specific topic that we would really need to engage with. There's a lot of work that's going into um, antibiotic uh, resistance, but not as much uh, work that's going into antifungal and antiviral resistance. You've also touched on uh, towards the end, Mr. Aistek, about research questions and potential novel answers um, and I can highlight that um, the phages that you've mentioned, that, uh, that some of the research that colleagues on Mafi King campus is doing in collaboration with uh, Dr. Tim McAllister. There's also the uh, nanoparticle um, research that um, some of us from uh, the two campuses are doing with, with chemistry. So yes, we are touching, and there's also some other alternatives that um, of the work that is being uh, done. So um, I want to thank you all for um, attending this workshop and, and to the guest speakers. Thank you very much. Uh, it was insightful um, and there's a lot of messages uh, coming out of it for the program director. Thank you, Mr. Program Director for uh, conducting this uh, in the way that you have done. So from my side, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Carlos. We, we quite appreciate your leadership and we continue to appreciate that. I ask some questions that people are not able to answer so there will be no winners. Um, so um, with the permission of um, the organizers of the of this event, I would like to close the session. Thank you. Bye.